testing.
Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes. We'll probably get started at around 12, 10.
Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you for coming to my CE. My name is Katie and I'm one of the PGY1 pharmacy residents. Today we'll be reviewing what to do when you're in trouble, an overview of antimicrobial induced nephrotoxicity. So firstly, I would just like to recognize that I have no financial interests or affiliations with any organizations um, and just the brand names that are used in this presentation are included for identification purposes only. In terms of our pharmacist objectives today, we will list common antimicrobials implicated in the incidence of nephrotoxicity. Uh, we will identify mechanisms of nephrotoxicity caused by various antimicrobial agents, recognize methods of managing antimicrobial induced nephrotoxicity, and discuss the available literature regarding the incidence of antimicrobial induced nephrotoxicity. So first off, we're just going to begin with an overview and background of what exactly nephrotoxicity is and the anatomy of the nephron itself. So we're just going to familiarize ourselves with some basic terms. The kidney is the main organ required by the human body in, in order to perform detoxification, regulation of extracellular fluids, homeostasis, and excretion of toxic metabolites. The kidney itself contains its own functional units called nephrons, which carry out the removal of waste, toxins, and excess substances in the blood. So now we define nephrotoxicity as the rapid deterioration in kidney function due to toxic effects of medications and chemicals. Nephrotoxicity itself is accompanied by a plethora of mechanisms, which we will dive into during this presentation. However, in terms of the medication aspect of nephrotoxicity, about 20% of nephrotoxicity is induced by medications themselves. And additionally, in order to assess and monitor the incidence of nephrotoxicity in a patient, we know that we can use both blood urea nitrogen and serum creatinine as markers. On this slide, I just wanted to visually illustrate the anatomy of the nephrons found in the kidney. As you can see, the afferent arterial feeds into the glomerulus which itself is a high pressure capillary bed and the filtered fluid flows through the proximal convoluted tubule followed by the loop of Henle and finally into the distal convoluted tubule before ex exiting the nephron into the shared collecting ducts. And the blood is able to exit the glomerulus via the efferent arterial. So now that we've briefly talked about nephrotoxicity and the anatomy of the nephron, I wanted to open today's presentation with a study that highlights the incidence of nephrotoxicity specifically due to antimicrobial use. So this is a study from 2013, which was a prospective study performed at a hospital in Iran. The authors of this study sought to evaluate the frequency, characteristics, and possible predisposing factors of antimicrobial induced AKI at their hospital. The study enrolled 424 patients who were receiving at least one antimicrobial agent, and they were monitored closely during their hospital course for occurrence of acute kidney injury. On this slide, I wanted to highlight the most commonly used antimicrobials in this study. And as you can see, the most common ones included the beta-lactam antibiotics, aminoglycosides, vancomycin, and amphotericin B. Okay, so now that we've briefly talked about nephrotoxicity and the anatomy of the nephron. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why this is here. Okay, so I wanted to include a chart summarizing the incidence of AKI in these hospitalized patients receiving the following regimens. For example, the 13 patients receiving amphotericin B, this group 76.9% developed in AKI. Additionally, in the 10 patients receiving vancomycin plus amikacin, you can see that 40% of these patients developed in AKI. And then finally, we see in the three patients that were receiving vancomycin plus amphotericin B, all three of these patients developed in AKI. So overall, you can see that the incidence of AKI in this study was mainly associated with the beta-lactams, aminoglycosides, vancomycin, and amphotericin B. So in addition to these results, I wanted to highlight other findings from the study as well. Firstly, the study was able to identify independent risk factors for antibiotic-induced nephrotoxicity, which included the presence of diabetes or dehydration, as well as the administration of nephrotoxic combinations. And actually, in fact, 30% of the patients were found to have a history of current use of other nephrotoxic agents, such as NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors, or diuretics. 
Additionally, of all the patients included in this study, 17.9% of them developed an antimicrobial induced AKI. And in these patients, their serum creatinine was actually found to be significantly increased from baseline. So from the study, we observe a comprehensive picture of the antimicrobials with the highest likelihood of causing AKI, such as, like we said, vancomycin, the aminoglycosides, the beta-lactams, and amphotericin B. And additionally, from the study, we also observed risk factors for the development of antimicrobial-induced nephrotoxicity. So generally, the authors recommend avoiding nephrotoxicity by monitoring the patient's volume status and avoiding other medications with known renal toxicity when possible. So from practice and from the study that we just reviewed, we know that nephrotoxicity can be common among the antimicrobials. However, with nephrotoxicity comes its various mechanisms that have been observed over the years. And these include acute interstitial nephritis, glomerulonephritis, myoglobinuria, which can result from rhabdomyolysis, crystal nephropathy, and acute tubular necrosis. And during today's presentation, we will focus more on acute interstitial nephritis, crystal nephropathy, and acute tubular necrosis, as these mechanisms have most frequently been implicated in antimicrobial-induced nephrotoxicity. So now that we've briefly touched on nephrotoxicity and the anatomy of the nephron, we'll just take a look at um, the mechanisms of nephrotoxicity more in depth. So the first one that we will talk about today is acute interstitial nephritis. Now this is an immune mediated injury to the intertubular, extraglomerular and extravascular space of the kidneys that can cause renal failure. The tubulo interstitial injury that occurs in acute interstitial nephritis can be caused by medications, infections, or other etiologies. And this type of renal injury is typically accompanied by the abrupt deterioration uh, in renal function. And it is also characterized histopathologically by inflammation and edema of the renal interstitium. So how do we identify a patient with acute interstitial nephritis? Previously, small studies assisted in making urine eosinophils, the go-to non-invasive test for assessing acute interstitial nephritis. And these studies had significant diagnostic value, but their sample sizes were small and diagnosis was not confirmed with biopsy. Eventually, more recent findings showed that urine eosinophils can lead to misdiagnoses, as they can also be produced by other renal or urinary tract abnormalities, such as urinary tract infections, acute tubular necrosis, and glomerulonephritis. So ultimately, the diagnosis of drug-induced acute interstitial nephritis should be made after exclusion of other etiologies and confirmation of drug exposure history. And this diagnosis is ultimately reinforced when the kidney function improves um, after the offending agent is discontinued. If the kidney function does not improve after discontinuation of the offending agent, a kidney biopsy may be necessary. Okay, so acyclovir is an antiviral that has the potential to cause nephrotoxicity by different mechanisms that I have listed on the left-hand side. And the first that we'll talk about is this acute interstitial nephritis. So the effects of acute interstitial nephritis may be observed on the renal transporters and the tubule cells. And in terms of managing acute interstitial nephritis secondary to acyclovir therapy, nephrotoxicity is reversible upon rehydration of the patient and either dose reduction or discontinuation of the drug altogether. So in terms of pre preventing the incidence of acute interstitial nephritis due to acyclovir therapy, it is important to adequately hydrate the patient, monitor renal function frequently, and make any dosage adjustments that may be indicated during therapy. So another class of, uh, of medications implicated in acute interstitial nephritis is the beta-lactams. So the main antigenic mechanism associated with the beta-lactams includes a response to either a conjugation product of the drug or its metabolite um, with a host protein or direct binding of the drug to a particular allele to elicit this hypersensitivity response that we see in acute interstitial nephritis. However, other mechanisms of injury exist with this class, such as tubular cell transport, which mainly takes place through the antiluminal organic anion secretory carrier. In the class overall, the agents with the greatest risk of renal toxicity are the carbapenems. However, typically renal toxicity is rarely observed with the penicillins and is regarded as uncommon with the cephalosporins. 
the most nephrotoxic beta lactam has been found to be amapenem, which has sufficient cellular uptake reactivity and generalized toxicity to mitochondrial substrate carriers, which can be severely nephrotoxic. And this is why imipenem is formulated with psilostatin, which is a nephroprotective renal transport inhibitor. So in the adult population, the, combina the combination of vancomycin and zosin was found to have significantly higher rates of nephrotoxicity when compared to vancomycin and other beta-lactams such as meropenem and cefepime or even vancomycin monotherapy. Additionally, in the pediatric population, this combination was also found to have significantly higher rates of AKI compared to the other groups. However, we'll speak more about the vancomycin plus beta-lactam combination later on in the presentation. I just wanted to highlight that ultimately the nephrotoxic beta-lactam should be isolated and discontinued in order to prevent potential fibrosis or chronic kidney disease. So next, the fluoroquinolones have different mechanisms of nephrotoxicity, but it's mostly most commonly caused by acute interstitial nephritis. And this acute interstitial nephritis secondary to fluoroquinolone therapy has been attributed to a type three hypersensitivity reaction. And this is by formation of antigen antibody immune complexes. So nephrotoxicity due to fluoroquinolone use is often reversed upon discontinuation. However, sometimes further treatment may be required and often includes supportive therapy and extra renal purification by conventional intermittent hemodialysis. Next, we'll talk about vancomycin, which is typically the drug that comes to mind when we are talking about nephrotoxicity. The exact mechanism of vancomycin-induced nephrotoxicity is not completely understood. However, the most probable mechanism can be attributed to an increase, uh, increased production of reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. So the oxidative effects on the proximal renal tubule often result in renal tubular ischemia. In addition to this mechanism, vancomycin has also actually been shown to interfere with the normal reabsorption function of the proximal renal tubule epithelium, and it can also alter the mitochondrial function of these cells. So ultimately, a combination of these mechanisms is what causes vancomycin-induced renal toxicity. So vancomycin used at its current recommended doses is minimally nephrotoxic when used in non-critically ill patients with less serious infections. However, in sicker patients with multiple risk factors for uh, AKI, vancomycin-associated nephrotoxicity occurs much more commonly, but it remains uncertain to what degree vancomycin is actually directly responsible. So in these more critically ill patients with multiple risk factors, it is safe to initiate vancomycin therapy with the use of therapeutic drug monitoring and antimicrobial stewardship while pending culture results. There are a number of different risk factors that could accelerate or potentiate the risk of vancomycin-induced nephrotoxicity, which I have listed on this slide for your reference. So as you can see, the most documented risk factors include high vancomycin dose greater than four grams daily, or high vancomycin trough greater than 15 milligrams per liter, concomitant treatment with nephrotoxic agents, prolonged therapy greater than seven days, and admission to an intensive care unit, especially with a prolonged length of stay. I also wanted to note that treatment with vancomycin beyond one week actually increases the incidence of nephrotoxicity from 6% to 21%. And this incidence actually increases steadily to 30% in vancomycin therapy exceeding more than two weeks. So in short, the longer we leave these patients on vancomycin, the higher their risk of nephrotoxicity creeps up. The incidence of vancomycin-associated nephrotoxicity is often potentiated when a patient is receiving concomitant medications with potential to cause renal injury. So medications that are associated with an increased risk of vancomycin-associated nephrotoxicity have been found to include the loop diuretics, acyclovir, amphotericin B, and the aminoglycosides. And in fact, the concurrent use of aminoglycosides with vancomycin has been associated with a 20 to 30% increase in renal injury. Additionally, studies show a twofold increase in the frequency of nephrotoxicity in patients receiving both vancomycin and zosin. This is because zosin was found to decrease the renal clearance of vancomycin, resulting in its accumulation. So in summary, the concurrent use of nephrotoxin should really be avoided during vancomycin therapy. 
Obviously, when it's unavailable, these concurrent therapies should be monitored daily in order to limit the duration and risk of adverse effects. In terms of vancomycin-associated nephrotoxicity specifically, most mild cases typically resolve upon discontinuation of the medication. However, in patients with both severely elevated plasma vancomycin concentrations and impaired clearance, the risk of permanent renal damage increases, so aggressive drug elimination may be indicated. High flux hemodialysis allows for the improved elimination of large molecules with a reported vancomycin removal rate of up to 79%. So just to summarize the management of acute interstitial nephritis overall, I included this flowchart. Obviously, the first action that we make in the setting of acute interstitial nephritis is to decrease the dose of or withdraw the offending drug. After this is done, renal function should begin to reverse. So from here, we will just be providing supportive care and closely monitoring the patient. At this point, the patient and their renal function will begin to improve. However, if the patient's renal function does not improve within one week or starts to rapidly deteriorate, corticosteroid use may be indicated. So as we know, there is this underlying immune-mediated damage in drug-induced acute interstitial nephritis, and this is the rationale behind the use of corticosteroid therapy. So although corticosteroids have been used for decades, efficacy for the treatment of drug-induced acute interstitial nephritis has not been evaluated in a randomized control trial and evidence from existing trials has supported the potential benefit of early administration on long-term recovery of kidney function. Additionally, in existing trials at one month follow-up, serum creatinine concentrations were found to be lower than when used for shorter durations. So because of the evidence that we have from existing trials, it's recommended that when corticosteroids are used in acute interstitial nephritis, they should be initiated early and continued on for at least a month. However, ultimately, the decision to use corticosteroids is made by assessing uh, factors such as the severity of AKI, presence of fibrosis, and the type of offending agent. Additionally, if the decision is made to use corticosteroids to assist in treatment of acute interstitial nephritis, they are usually dosed in prednisone equivalent doses from 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram per day for two weeks and then tapered off slowly over several weeks. All right, so now we'll review what we've learned with a patient case. So MJ is a 67-year-old male on the general medicine floor who is currently receiving vancomycin one gram every 12 hours for osteomyelitis. Today is day three of vancomycin and his serum creatinine has uptrended to 1.5 from 1.1 the day before. His vancomycin trough today comes back at 17.6. Okay, so which of the following risk factors for vancomycin induced nephrotoxicity does this patient exhibit? And you can just throw your answer in the chat. Yeah, so it is B and we'll just go through it. So A is incorrect as doses greater than four grams a day are associated with vancomycin induced nephrotoxicity. Our patient right now is only receiving um, two grams daily. C is incorrect as the patient has only been on vancomycin for three days. And D is incorrect because the patient is currently located on a general medicine floor. So B is correct because um, from the studies, they have shown that troughs greater than 15 milligrams per deciliter have been I'm sorry, milligrams per liter have been associated with vancomycin induced nephrotoxicity. So the second mechanism of nephrotoxicity that we will talk about today is crystal nephropathy. And there are medications that cause intratubular precipitation of crystals that are insoluble in the urine. And this often occurs in the distal renal tubules. The crystals are mainly composed of calcium phosphate, uric acid, cysteine, or adenine, and acidic urine precipitates the medications and causes crystal nephropathy, especially in patients with baseline renal impairment. So as you may expect, these crystals cause obstruction and eventual interstitial inflammation in our patients. So as we know, acyclovir can cause crystal nephropathy via intratubular crystal precipitation. This leads to interstitial congestion and hemorrhage and can eventually result in decreased renal blood flow. So typically we observe crystal nephropathy develops within 24 to 48 hours um, of initiation of acyclovir. And this effect is usually seen with rapid administration of high doses. 
So crystal nephropathy observed with acyclovir use can actually be preventable. Firstly, before initiation of acyclovir therapy, patients should be uvolemic. And in addition to avoiding other nephrotoxic agents, the dose of acyclovir should be adjusted in the case that the patient's renal function at initiation is abnormal. Finally, when the drug is being administered, it should be administered via slow infusion over one to two hours, as we know that rapid infusion can cause um, the crystal formation. So these methods prevent crystal precipitation and subs subsequent tubular obstruction. When treating acyclovir-induced crystal nephropathy, the approach remains the same as prevention in the sense that the dose should be adjusted. However, it can also be discontinued if necessary. Additionally, IV fluids should be given at a rate of over 150 milliliters per hour to establish high urinary flow. And finally, if the injury is severe, hemodialysis may be considered in the treatment as well. Amoxicillin-induced crystal nephropathy is a rarely reported adverse drug reaction that is not related to hypersensitivity. This adverse drug reaction is described as the onset of sudden, sometimes painful macroscopic hematuria associated with an increase in creatinine level in patients receiving amoxicillin. So kidney injury results from the precipitation of amoxicillin crystals, either in the renal tubules, which results in tubular damage, or in the urinary tract, which results in kidney obstruction. Amoxicillin-induced crystal nephropathy has been observed in patients receiving either daily high-dose amoxicillin for treating current infections, and in patients receiving even just a single dose of amoxicillin for surgical prophylaxis. So typically, outcomes are favorable after the discontinuation of amoxicillin. However, sometimes renal replacement therapy may also be temporarily required. Amoxicillin-induced crystal nephropathy was previously sporadically reported until now. However, a recent study observed its dramatic increase in a cohort of adult patients receiving high doses of amoxicillin for osteoarticular infections. Recently, crystal urea due to ciprofloxacin has been recorded in two out of 63,000 patients and has been observed in both animals and humans. Although rarely reported, ciprofloxacin-induced crystal urea has typically been observed in patients with basic urine with a pH greater than 7.3. Successful treatment strategies that have been reported include both hydration of the patient with isotonic or hypotonic solutions and urine alkalinization. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears and talk about the antiviral Fosgrenet. Fosgrenet causes nephrotoxicity via different mechanisms, including both crystal nephropathy and acute tubular necrosis, which we'll talk about later. I included both of the mechanisms on this slide as they seem to be related to each other. But basically, little is known about the incidence and mechanisms of Fosgrenet-induced nephrotoxicity. As most data comes from renal allograft recipients, patients with severe underlying disease, or patients taking concomitant nephrotoxic drugs. So from the data that does exist, we know that phosphornet does, does cause crystal nephropathy, which can accumulate in the proximal tubular cells. And this is why phosphornet is also associated with acute tubular necrosis. Additionally, I wanted to touch on the adverse effect associated with phosphornet called Fanconi syndrome, which is a kidney tubule disorder in which substances such as glucose, salts, and uric acid are released into the urine instead of being reabsorbed into the bloodstream. And this adverse effect may also play a role in the incidence of crystal nephropathy with phosgrenet use. In terms of prevention, prehydration of the patient with 2.5 liters of isotonic saline throughout the course of therapy with phosgrenet almost completely abolishes its nephrotoxicity. So many patients who are being treated with medications may have additional risk factors that increase the likelihood of crystal nephropathy, such as true or effective intravascular volume depletion and underlying renal insufficiency. Renal failure when using these agents may be preventable if it is anticipated by appropriate drug dosing, volume expansion with high urinary flow, and urine alkalinization when appropriate. Additionally, renal failure may be reversible upon discontinuation of the offending drug and is further managed by appropriate dose adjustment, volume repletion, and again, urine alkalinization. 
Okay, so now we'll review a second patient case. PR is a 55 year old male presenting to the emergency department with altered mental status. After being admitted, the primary team wants to pursue empiric therapy for meningitis. In addition to vancomycin and ceftriaxone, the primary team wants to initiate acyclovir. So which of the following approaches to the prevention of acyclovir induced crystal nephropathy should be applied to this patient? D. Hey. Yes, so it's D, all of the above. And this is the correct answer as all the choices are approaches that have been studied and successfully used to prevent acyclovir induced crystal nephropathy. So our final mechanism that we'll talk about today is acute tubular necrosis. Acute tubular necrosis is the most common intrinsic cause of AKI and is associated with high morbidity and mortality. It is most commonly observed in hospitalized patients and can occur following ischemia, toxin exposure, or sepsis. Within the renal tubules, the proximal tubule cells are exposed to drugs in the process of concentration and reabsorption through the glomerulus. These proximal tubule cells are influenced greatly by drug toxicity. Toxicity within the tubular cells arises via different mechanisms, including damage to the tubular mitochondria, disturbances within the tubular transport system, and increases in oxidative stress due to free radical generation. Acute tubular necrosis associated with the aminoglycosides occurs in 10 to 20% of therapeutic courses. Additionally, 10% of the administered aminoglycoside dose is accumulated in the kidney. So aminoglycoside-induced nephrotoxicity is characterized by slow rises in the serum creatinine, creatinine while there are marked decreases in the glomerular filtration rate. So acidic phospholipids are binding sites for the aminoglycosides that in the brush border of the membrane of proximal tubular cells. So the aminoglycosides are taken up into the epithelial cells of the renal proximal tubules and they stay there for a long time causing this nephrotoxicity. Additionally, megalin, which is a giant endocytic receptor expressed at the apical membrane of renal proximal tubules, plays an important role in binding and endocytosis of the aminoglycosides in the proximal tubular cells. Just to summarize the nephrotoxicity associated with the mechanism of acute tubular necrosis that I described in the previous slide, I included a graphic representation. So here you can see that the aminoglycoside drugs are labeled as AG in the diagram, and they are attracted to the anionic phospholipid membranes where they interact with the megalin receptor on the apical surface. And this is followed by increased cellular uptake of the drug by the proximal tubule cells. So you can see that they're entering the cell here. And then the aminoglycosides are endocytosed and enter the cell where they are translocated into the lysosomes as seen here. Ultimately, this lysosomal injury and rupture along with mitochondrial in injury results in tubular cell toxicity. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the antifungal amphotericin B. So nephrotoxicity is the most common and most serious adverse effect associated with amphotericin B that occurs relatively early during therapy. However, it can be reversible in most patients. So nephrotoxicity that is observed with amphotericin B use is due to direct action of the drug on the renal tubules as well as drug-induced renal vasoconstriction. So these mechanisms together are working to, you know, create this tubular damage and it's, well, it's a well-known problem associated with amphotericin B and can cause serious complications like acute renal failure. Although nephrotoxicity with amphotericin B can occur in any patient, there are certain patient populations who are more likely to develop nephrotoxicity during treatment. So on this slide, I just have listed risk factors associated with amphotericin B-induced nephrotoxicity, such as male gender, high daily dose, high body weight, concomitant use of nephrotoxic agents and abnormal baseline in renal, abnormal baseline renal function. In these patients, if we're considering using amphotericin B for a fungal infection, 
it's imperative to monitor their renal function as they are at higher risk of developing nephrotoxicity. So how do we suspect that a patient has developed nephrotoxicity while receiving amphotericin B? On this slide, I have identified specific clinical manifestations that have been researched and associated with the use of amphotericin B. And as you can see, these findings um, typically are associated with renal impairment as well as electrolyte imbalances. In order to combat the nephrotoxicity associated with amphotericin B over the years, an approach to reduce its incidence was to complex the drug with lipids or to entrap it in liposomes. It was observed that this liposomal amphotericin B was found to be significantly safer than conventional amphotericin B in terms of serum creatinine increase. Additionally, infusion-related reactions occurred less frequently with the liposomal form of amphotericin B compared, compared to the conventional form. So ultimately, it was found that the lipid formulations of amphotericin B um, were not only less nephrotoxic, but there were also less infusion-related reactions compared to the deoxycholate form of amphotericin B with at least equivalent efficacy. So we'll also now transition to another antiviral, sidofovir. And the use of antiviral, this antiviral is accompanied by a dose-limiting nephrotoxicity that can lead to proximal tubular cell injury and acute renal failure. Sidofovir induced apoptosis has have also been observed in human proximal tubular cells. Available data suggests that the induction of apoptosis is the primary mechanism that contributes to sidofovir induced nephrotoxicity. So probenicid is a competitive inhibitor of organic anion transport in the proximal tubular epithelial cells. So because of this mechanism, it was previously evaluated for its effect on the chronic toxicity of sidofovir and was found to prevent against sidofovir induced nephrotoxicity because it is acting on these tubular cells. That's the focus of the sidofovir induced nephrotoxicity. So in practice, when a patient is receiving sidofovir, um, therapy should be accompanied by both probenicid and fluids. And I'll go into the exact regimen on the next slide. So again, I just included this as a visual for the timeline of, uh, of sidofovir therapy. So three hours um, prior to the sidofovir dose, premedication with two grams of probenicid is recommended. And this is followed by premedication with one gram two hours prior to the sidofovir dose. In addition to probenicid, patients should also receive one liter of normal saline infused over one to two hours prior to sidofovir use. And also if tolerated patients may also receive a second liter over one to three hours at the start of or immediately following sidofovir infusion. And then finally, we end the timeline um, eight hours after sidofovir infusion where one gram of probenicid should be given again. So these therapies given in conjunction with sidofovir aim to diminish the nephrotoxicity that accompanies the drug. So overall, most of the management of acute tubular necrosis includes supportive care. Obviously, all nephrotoxic agents should be discontinued whenever possible. Additionally, it is important to maintain uvolemia in the patient as well as provide them nutritional support. Any present infection should be treated, preferably without nephrotoxic drugs. And finally, diuretics may be used to maintain urine output in oliguric acute tubular necrosis. However, its benefit is unproven and doesn't alter the course of kidney injury. So now that we have a better understanding of the kidney as well as the different mechanisms that we talked about that can cause nephrotoxicity, let's take a look at some of the recent trials that have been conducted in the past five years regarding the use of vancomycin in conjunction with Zosin. So over the next couple of slides, I will be covering different meta-analyses, studies, and literature reviews that have been conducted in um, assessing the incidence of AKI with the combination of vancomycin and zosin. In general, the combination has been known to cause nephrotoxicity via different mechanisms that are working simultaneously. So as I said before, vancomycin may accumulate and lead to acute tubular necrosis and glomerular destruction, while the piperacillin component of zosin likely causes acute interstitial nephritis. 
um, like we talked about before with the beta-lactam class. And this combination of mechanisms is ultimately what causes nephrotoxicity. So we'll begin with the meta-analysis performed in 2016. And this includes 14 studies that assess data comparing vancomycin plus zosin versus vancomycin monotherapy. This 2016 meta-analysis concluded that there was an increased incidence of AKI observed with the use of vancomycin plus zosin. Additionally, in 2017, a retrospective matched cohort study was conducted in 558 patients comparing vancomycin plus zosin versus vancomycin plus cefepime. In this study, the onset of AKI was observed in, vanco in the vancomycin plus zosin group after a median of three days. And additionally, an increased incidence and more rapid onset of AKI was observed with the combination of vancomycin plus zosin compared to vancomycin plus cefepime. In 2018, another meta-analysis was conducted and included 15 studies as well as 17 abstracts. The studies and abstracts included assessed many different comparators in comparison to vancomy vancomycin plus zosin, as you can see here. They compared against vancomycin plus cefepime, plus the carbapenems, vancomycin monotherapy, and zosin monotherapy. But in the end, the authors all reached a conclusion that there is an increased rate and odds of AKI, as well as less time to AKI compared, uh, associated with the vancomycin plus zosin combination. And then finally, we arrive at the literature review that was conducted back recently in 2020 by covert and colleagues that included 18 studies comparing vancomycin plus zosin versus vancomycin plus meropenem and vancomycin plus cefepime. So here, the authors arrive at the conclusion that the decision to continue this combination past 72 hours can be harmful and the risks and benefits of continuing therapy should be evaluated by the team. All right, so let's apply what we've learned from these studies to a patient case. AP is a 54-year-old female who presents to the emergency department with a diabetic foot infection. On presentation, she is febrile, and the primary team is adamant on initiating vancomycin and zosin empirically for her infection. So which of the following actions would be most appropriate for the patient at this time? Yes, so the answer is A. And, you know, this is because in choices B and C, we would risk reducing the empiric coverage that the patient would need for their diabetic foot infection. And obviously the patient is febrile. In choice D, we would not want the patient to be on such broad therapy for 14 days. As we saw with all of the studies, the incidence of AKI is high. So in choice A, we would be providing empiric coverage for the patient's infection while also minimizing the risk of AKI as much as we can. We recall that in the 2017 study, AKI was found to occur with this combination at day three. And additionally, in the study from 2020, we recall that therapy past 72 hours can be potentially harmful. So this combination should be reassessed based on the risk versus benefits at this point. So here it would be appropriate to have the combination on for three days and then reassess and deescalate as appropriate as by then culture should have come back as well. So after looking at the various studies and data that have been isolated about the incidence of nephrotoxicity due to antimicrobial use, we're able to draw conclusions that I will summarize for us. So firstly, we see that some of the antimicrobials that are often implicated um, in the antimicrobial induced nephrotoxicity include vancomycin, aminoglycosides, beta-lactams and amphotericin B. Additionally, we obviously see that there has been various studies assessing the combination of vancomycin and zosin. And we have observed that there is a higher incidence and more rapid onset of AKI um, with this combination in, compared, in comparison to vancomycin plus other beta-lactams or even monotherapy. And then finally, through all of this, we recall that pharmacists do play a vital role in making recommendations to switch or deescalate antimicrobial agents as well as in weighing out the different risks versus benefits of initiating or continue, continuing certain nephrotoxic antimicrobials, especially in individuals who may be at higher risk of developing nephrotoxicity. All right, so that concludes my presentation and I will open to any questions that you guys might have.
All right, so if there's no questions, um, I will be emailing the post CE questions as well as the code afterwards later this afternoon or tonight. Thank you for coming.